Muchas gracias. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce the International Conference on Verbal Humor, which will be held from today to the uh, 25th of October. The Griali Research Group, which promotes this conference, works on verbal humor and irony since 2002. This conference means the closing of two of our research projects called uh, Griali Observa and uh, Genumid, focus on the research of humor, gender, and identity. And this is also a proof of the progress of the research project Figure Kid, dedicated to the study of figurativeness in children, and more precisely, the metapragmatics of humor and its acquisition. This conference brings together several approaches to humor, as we will see during the five plenary lectures and more than 100 presentations that are arranged in the program. I would like to point out the scholars of this conference come from around 40 different countries, such as the United States, New Zealand, Belgium, France, Russia, Mexico, Colombia, Greece, Morocco, Australia, etc. The presentations are distributed in 10 panels humor, gender, and identity, linguistic element of humor, humor and acquisition, humor and language, teaching and learning, humor and irony, humor and digital discourses, humor and translation, and taboo. I think it's a great opportunity to share knowledge on the latest research on the linguistics of humor and create new research bonds among the researchers. It is also a good occasion to enjoy our cultural program and to know Alicante and its university. I would like to thank all the scholars who were willing to participate at this international conference. Enjoy the joy of humor. Quisiera resaltar que contamos con un programa cultural. En primer lugar, hoy mismo, a las 13.30, se inaugurará en la Sala IFOS la exposición Antología de Humor Social. Deseo agradecer muy especialmente la labor de Enrique Pérez Penedo, que siempre ha colaborado con la idea de organizar una exposición de viñetas y que ha dado forma a lo que podremos admirar desde hoy mismo. Se celebran con esta antología los 20 años de la iniciativa Humor Social, que se ha dedicado en cada ocasión a un tema social como los malos tratos, la violencia de género, etc. También deseo agradecer los textos que han elaborado para el catálogo del evento el señor rector magnífico de la Universidad de Alicante, el doctor Manuel Palomar, y la señora vicerrectora de Investigación y Transparencia del Conocimiento, que hoy nos acompaña, la doctora Amparo Navarro. Agradezco públicamente en este acto su participación. También dentro del programa cultural podemos disfrutar esta tarde a partir de las 7 y aquí mismo en el Paraninfo de una charla entrevista en la que participan David Guapo, Dani Alés, Patricia Sornosa y Patricia Espe Espejo. I would like to, to say that uh, this talk interview will be translated into uh, English, from Spanish into English. A dicha charla, que seguro será muy interesante, seguirán los monólogos de tres cómicas, Virginia Riguezú, Valeria Ross y Raquel Sastre. También dentro de nuestro programa hemos organizado una mesa redonda sobre los límites del humor en la que participan profesionales del humor como Marta González de Vega, Miguel Sánchez Romero, Cap, Enrique, Raquel Sastre y Dani Alés. Quiero resaltar que la organización y financiación de este evento científico han participado, por un lado, el Grupo Griale, promotor de la idea, los proyectos relacionados dentro del seno de Griale, como Griale Observa, Genumid y Figurkid, los vicerrectorados de Cultura, Deporte y Lenguas y de Investigación y Transferencia de Conocimiento, los Institutos de Investigación de Estudios de Género y el YULMA de Lenguas Aplicadas, la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, el Departamento de Filología Española, Lingüística General y Teoría de la Literatura, el Grupo de Investigación Aqua, Ciudad de Elda, Ciudad del Turismo, perdón, el Consejo Regulador de Gijona y Turrón de Alicante y las empresas Carmencita, Licores, Alonso, Tram y Prunita. Quiero manifestar que como directora de este Congreso Internacional me siento muy orgullosa y muy contenta de que hoy se inicie la celebración de este Congreso Internacional sobre el Humor Verbal, en el que hemos invertido tanto esfuerzo, ilusión y ganas. 
En mi nombre y en el del comité organizador les animo a disfrutar de todo lo que hemos preparado a lo largo de estos tres días. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Leonor. Eh, tiene la palabra el decano de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, profesor Juan Mesa. Bueno. Gracias, señora vicerrectora de Investigación y Transferencia del Conocimiento. Gracias, profesora Leonor Ruiz Gurillo, y enhorabuena por la organización de este Congreso Internacional y enhorabuena a todo el grupo de investigación Griale, que es uno de nuestros grupos de investigación que realmente desarrolla una actividad absolutamente extraordinaria y es uno de esos grupos que explica la posición tan inmejorable que tiene la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras dentro de los rankings. Ocupa en estos momentos la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras un puesto entre las 400 mejores del mundo, entre los aproximadamente 55.000 centros de educación superior y esto se debe precisamente al buen hacer de grupos como Griale. Me permitiré, me permitirán casi un símil deportivo. Cuando se tienen grupos como Griale, cuando se tienen jugadores como Nadal, el buen gestor, el buen entrenador, lo único que tiene que hacer es no estropearlos, no hacer nada para que las cosas no fluyan de la manera adecuada. Debo darles la bienvenida especialmente a las personas que nos acompañan y que se han acercado hasta nuestra Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, a nuestra Universidad de Alicante, desde diferentes puntos del de globo. Realmente el humor nos ha traído aquí y anticipando alguna de las cosas que quiero trasladarles, obviamente eh, hay hasta un juego de palabras. Al ver el nombre del Congreso, Congreso Internacional sobre el Humor Verbal, nadie piensa en el mal humor sino que todos inmediatamente pensamos en el buen humor, que es lo que realmente importa. Ya en la literatura clásica, Quintiliano, en el Instituto, Instituto Oratoria, en el capítulo 93 de su libro décimo, después de haber analizado todos los géneros literarios, dice esa famosa frase tan utilizada en los manuales de literatura latina de Satura cuiden tota nostra est. Claro, esa frase, cuando la está utilizando, cuando la está trasladando a esos aprendices de rétores y oradores de la antigua Roma en el siglo I después de Cristo, lo que está haciendo es reivindicar que hay un género literario, al menos uno, en el cual la influencia de Grecia ha sido mucho menor y que puede reivindicarse como algo propio. Pero no es casual que sea la sátira, no es casual que sea un género que utiliza justamente los ingredientes del humor, los ingredientes cómicos para hacerlo. Porque justamente, y ahora voy al otro gran término relacionado con el humor, con la sátira, que es lo cómico. Cómico viene del griego comos, por lo tanto del pueblo. Realmente es la manera en que cada pueblo se expresa, cada forma de entender el humor y que a veces nos hace tan complicadas las traducciones del género cómico de los diferentes géneros que pueden tratar el humor o la traducción cotidiana. Porque claro, al ser el humor algo que nos acompaña día a día, al ser cotidiano, es esencialmente verbal. Porque desde que nos levantamos hasta que nos acostamos, justamente las reglas de la convivencia también nos llevan a que tenemos que utilizar el humor porque si no, a veces, la convivencia sería muy complicada. Y claro, es una cuestión médica, porque humor humoris significa líquido, es el equilibrio de los líquidos que tenemos que alcanzar gracias a diferentes gestos. Los médicos luego, en su momento, utilizaban las sangrías, o nos pueden poner ahora un gotero con suero, pero realmente... Si nos levantamos con buen humor, si nos dedicamos a una sonrisa, nuestros humores se equilibran y todo ello es mucho mejor. Por ello, autores como Macrobio en Saturnales le dedica un libro entero, el libro segundo, a contar anécdotas jocosas de los emperadores, de quienes les rodeaban. Y luego dedica varios capítulos en el libro séptimo a que un buen conversador en un banquete tiene que dedicar 
una buena parte de su tiempo a contar chistes, a realizar juegos lingüísticos de carácter irónico y cómo, sobre todo, debe eliminarse la parte negativa del humor, que puede ser el sarcasmo, cuando lo que se está jugando es con el humor para herir a uno de los comensales, cosa que debería evitarse de todas maneras. Por eso, como he dicho, permítanme unirlo todo. El humor, ya desde el punto de vista etimológico y desde su tratamiento en la antigüedad, es saludable. Lo cómico forma parte de, no, de todos nosotros porque forma parte del pueblo, que somos todos, y además nos acompaña cada día. Y por ello podemos entender que la persecución de ese objetivo común, que es la felicidad colectiva, de la que nos hablan autores como José Antonio Marina, tiene como ingrediente fundamental el humor presidido siempre, por supuesto, por unos sólidos fundamentos éticos y resulta imprescindible, como digo, tanto como, utilizando la anécdota de Nuche Ordine, tanto como el aire que respiramos o que deberíamos respirar, que nos debemos olvidar de toda tragedia y debemos encontrar las claves que son comunes. Antes he dicho, cada pueblo tiene su sentido del humor, pero hoy unos elementos antropológicos, unos elementos que nos pueden unir y debemos colaborar en encontrarlos para que se convierta en ese elemento común de toda la especie humana, que se convierta toda la especie humana en un solo comos, en un solo pueblo solidario y esto, sin duda, para todos los investigadores que forman parte de este Congreso, es un reto fascinante. Así pues, reitero la enhorabuena a las organizadoras, Gracias a todos los participantes y a las entidades que han colaborado en la organización de este congreso. Seamos serios, pero no nos tomemos demasiado en serio. Busquemos la belleza, la sonrisa, la risa y la carcajada. Muchas gracias. Buenos días de nuevo a todas y a todas. Eh, welcome to the University of Alicante. Eh, dado que estamos en un congreso del humor, a mí me parece eh, una broma pesada tener que hablar después de una catedrática de lengua española y de un catedrático eh, de latín, porque obviamente el nivel eh, lingüístico eh, es difícilmente alcanzable y superable. Yo, en primer lugar, desde luego, quiero, quiero dar las gracias a, a las organizadoras, al, al Departamento de, de Lengua Española de la Universidad de Alicante y a la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras por haberme dado la oportunidad de estar con todos ustedes inaugurando, inaugurando este, este congreso. Desde luego, ustedes también se plantearán eh, por qué una vicerrectora de investigación eh, está en un congreso de, de humor eh, verbal. Desde luego porque es una línea de investigación clarísima dentro del ámbito de la lingüística. Eh, el humor es un lenguaje, es una, eh, es una palabra, la fina ironía, sobre todo ese humor ilustrado que intentamos mantener eh, todos nosotros en la universidad, siempre es el requiebro, el juego de la palabra, eh, el juego de, de, del conocimiento en, en cuando hablamos o cuando empleamos sinonimias, antonimias en, o la ambigüedad de la palabra en el, en el humor. Pero además el humor yo creo que es eh, multidisciplinar. En primer lugar porque es lo que nos hace humanos. No conozco de momento a ningún otro eh, ser vivo eh, que ría o sonría porque no, no tiene el lenguaje, por lo menos el lenguaje eh, verbal. En segundo lugar porque como nos hace más felices... Yo creo que desde el ámbito de las ciencias sociales el humor es un instrumento de paz y de concordia. Más vale que juguemos con el humor que juguemos con otras cosas. Porque tiene relación con el mundo de la salud, de las ciencias de la salud, como ha dicho el, el decano. Eh, según los neurocientíficos, cuando reímos eh, generamos endorfinas y por lo tanto nos sentimos eh, más a gusto eh, con nosotros. En el humor han entrado ya las nuevas tecnologías. Todos nos sorprendemos que cualquier noticia política, cualquier noticia de actualidad 
inmediatamente nos bombardean con lo que se llama memes, con un ingenuo, un ingenio que a veces nos llama poderosamente la atención. Y, eh, por supuesto, para los nuevos retos de la, eh, de la humanidad, entre ellas el reto del envejecimiento, de la población, eh, el humor yo creo que alarga la vida. Eh, por lo tanto, tomémonos la vida con humor, pensemos que además el humor es algo muy elevado, hay un humor ilustrado y yo creo que el humor ilustrado es el que representa eh, este Congreso. Así que muchas gracias por su atención, por estar con nosotros en la Universidad de Alicante y muchas gracias eh, Larisa, Leonor, por, por haber eh, impulsado este, este Congreso. Muchas gracias. Pues eh, queda inaugurado el, el Congreso de, sobre humor verbal. Vale. Muchas gracias. Good morning. I'd like to introduce the opening plenary lecture. Helga Kotov is a full professor in the German department at Freiburg University in Germany. She works in the fields of applied German anthropological, anthropological linguistics, sorry, basically on questions of interaction analysis, gender studies, humor, sociolinguistics, and ethnography of communication. Her current research includes interactional sociolinguistics, linguistics of German, conversational humor and irony, or an intercultural communication. Regarding humor, her research interests include conversational humor and gender humor. For instance, uh, she published her habilitation text entitled in German, Spatherstein to a pragmatic for conversational humor, on the pragmatics of conversational humor. Uh, the Nimeyer Publishing in 1998. In 2006, Dr. Kotov edited a special issue of journal pragmatics devoted to gender and humor. I find a uh, very, very interesting uh, this contribution. More precisely, her talk today will be the devoted to humor performance from women in Germany and their humor strategies. Her talk, as you can watch, is entitled Overdoing Gender and Unpoliteness in Performing Female Comic Figures on German TV. I would like to thank you, your participation, Helga, on this conference and your willingness to collaborate with Reality Research Group. Thanks, Helga, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Leonor, for your very nice words. And I would like to start with muchos, muchas gracias uh, to the Griale Group for the invitation to this talk, which is a great honor for me. I'm, uh, in my presentation, I'm going to discuss some dominant humor strategies of female comedians on German TV, as you just pointed out. On the one hand, we find parodies of female social types, such as models, politicians, girlies from the pop industry, or mafia brides, that we can approach by describing how the comedians overdo the type. On the other, we find a skipping of common face work standards in making fun of men and in playing with physical <clears throat> phenomena formerly taboo for women. The comedians often display persona who break gendered face expectations. I'll approach the analysis of comic figures and their linguistic performance with sociolinguistic interest, as Leonor al already said, similar to the socio-semiotic approach of the Griale group, 
I'll describe how comedians situate the comical persona they perform on stage and the milieu of this persona. At first, I shall shortly summarize the unequal gender relations in the history of popular media comedies as a starting point. From the beginning of film history, women have been active in front of and behind the camera, influencing the cinematographic reception on both sides of the stage. Nevertheless, the history of early film comedy has so far almost exclusively counted male actors like Max Linda, of course Chaplin and Harold Lloyd, Max and Charlie, even the Italian Polidoro, are familiar to many audiences from earlier film titles. Names such as Asta Nielsen or Ossi Osvalda, Gigetta Morani, Sara Duhamel wait to be discovered again. Fiegel in uh, 2010 interviewed eight well-known female Austrian columnists, cartoonists, and TV cabaret artists through expert interviews concerning their self-experienced connections between humor and gender in the media. According to these experts, women on the whole play on a smaller spectrum of humor practices. Many texts that men could take for humor were said to be not fitting for the conventional image of a middle-class woman, as was still expected in society. Crude sarcasm, for example, was taboo for women, but often produced by men. Many forms of humor contradict what etiquette manuals up to the, to the 70s of the last century demanded as ladylike behavior. Therefore, we'll identify changes in the body politics of feminine face work as one great line of many female comedians. We'll later, uh, we'll later see how today, uh, today's female comedians pick up indexes of masculinity formerly not acceptable for women and thus create specifically provocative female figures. For some years now, the comedian Kebekus, the first one, for example, has been making this her trademark. Others parody an array of social types with more or less critical intentions. Grotesque humor is part part of the new gender picture as well. Because the male comedian Mario Barth is very successful with performance shows that comicalize gender, I will shortly include him into my portrait here. Since the beginning of 2001, he's been on the road with stage programs such as Men Are Pigs, Women Too. For nearly 30 years, Women have been presenting a new range of humor styles and topics in the public sphere. But as early as the 80s, comedians on television and on stages began to step out of traditional roles which were basically the sexy but stupid bee embodied by Ingrid Steger, the old maid type, embodied by Helga Feddersen on, on German TV, or the incarnation of motherly wittiness embodied by Heidi Kabel. With Jessica Milner Davis, I stress that these courageous and talented pioneers paved the way for future generations. New feminist comedians such as Maren Kreumann, Hella von Sinnen or the Misfits in the late 80s established topics that previous television humor had not yet confronted. Today, female comedians represent an important group in the German, Austrian, and Swiss mass media as a whole. 
interdisciplinary studies of etiquette and good behavior literature, advice books and films show that even women authors demanded stronger politeness standards from women than from men. Also, investigations of several scholars edited, <clears throat> analyzed uh, etiquette and conduct literature from the Middle Ages to the last century. The etiquette researchers discuss the boundaries of conduct literature through theoretical examination of the gendered body as it is positioned in conduct books, etiquette books, poetry, fiction, and film. Drawing on Bartin and Foucault, they analyze the ways in which the body has been gendered in terms of class and sexuality. This was always influential in humor and limited the scope of female comedians. Goffman defined face as a social value a person claims for her or himself in an interpersonal contact depending on a coherent line, a pattern of verbal and nonverbal acts by which they express their self-image and negotiate their social representation. Facework has a ritual dimension as it is in the title of Goffman's essay. It shouldn't be identified with, with a personal identity. Much has been written about cultural differences, but not so much on gender. Uh, one very important contribution to the body dimension of, uh, uh, to the body dimension is Norbert Elias's book, The Civilizing Process, in fact an older book in which Elias traced how post-medieval European standards regarding violence, sexual behavior, bodily functions, table manners, and forms of speech were gradually transformed by increasing thresholds of shame and repugnance. The internalized self-restraint imposed by increasingly complex social demands always involved embodiment. Gender is a factor in this. Humor seems to be a safe means to confront face standards which were always stronger for women than for men. In the following, I shall conduct sketch analysis within the socio-semiotic um, socio framework of indexing gender. Such a procedure works with a description of the entire stage event from the stylization of the figure to the design of its, of its exterior and sequential sketch analysis. In the background is the sociology of knowledge in Ber Ber Berger and Luckman's terms with its communication theory that examines the development of jointly constructed understandings of the world that form the basis for shared assumptions about social reality. All intertextual plays that comedy so heavily relies on are based on knowing everyday normality, normalities as lots of researchers who sit here have pointed out, including gender normality as for example, Alvarado Ortega has pointed out. We then try to grasp the comic hyper-stylization of social types. I call that overdoing, overdo, the overdoing of gender. We all stylize ourselves to communicate a certain identity, and, uh, but we can, uh, yeah, it, it is overdone in comedy. Um, let's first uh, look at two examples from the 90s. Of course, I cannot go into the details of these transcripts. You have, that, have them all in your handout. The misfits became well known with their two characters, Mata and Lisbeth, two older ladies who run a funeral home in Oberhausen, that is in an industrial region of 
Germany, where they also bury the boys they had at their sides over the years. Their ways of speaking run blatantly counter to the stereotype of the older lady because they use an explicit vulgar language, confront societal taboos, for example, by burying a bandage to celebrate the menopause, and they also practice role reversal in many other ways. The example in, the, in your handout shows the two comedians talking about the sniveling of their men. In appearance, they depict older, conservatively dressed ladies who, however, fall completely out of their traditional roles. Such multimodal contrasts are very important for feminist humor. They practice, as I said, an explicit sexual vocabulary which indexes traditional masculinity. They behave as chauvinists and turn around the norms of everyday life. Um, the jest communication moves largely on the foil of the refraction or even reversal of traditional gender expectations. Surprise effects arise, for example, when the old ladies say about a man in a retirement home that he can no longer get it up, and similar chauvinistic phrases are expressed, which create a gulf between the appearance and the, of the cane-carrying figures with old-fashioned hats and clothing and their incongruous vocabulary and speaking time. I give you speaking style. I give you a short impression of them. Man, man. Oh. Mm. Männer, du. Sag mal, wie sagst du immer so schön? Ich sage immer, Männer sind wie Estpflaster. Gibt zwei Sorten, die eine hält nicht, die andere geht nicht ab. They talk, they talk about senal bedis, the senal bediscape of their men. I, I, now I go to line 19. Um, uh, Mata asks, uh, tell me, how do you like to say? Um, I keep saying men are like bandages. There are two kinds, one doesn't stick and the other can't be got off. Um, uh, okay, I, I can, I, as I said, I cannot go into all the details of this example. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it is funny that the bandage should be got off, that is, that some men should dissolve themselves again. Such wishes demonstratively break with the socially known ideals of most women who wish a faithful husband. The two ladies emphasize the independence of emancipated women and the friendship that unites them. It should also be noted that the misfits have popularized in the German-speaking world the ver a variety of Ruhr German, a dialect. In, uh, um, yeah, uh, there, there, there is a lot of register humor in in this, uh, Atado has written uh, an interesting article on register humor. Most German, Austrian, Swiss comedians perform in a dialect and thereby popularize that variety. They establish new faces for women in, uh, um, in government sense, new public self-images, how women want to be perceived by others. Um, just, uh, yeah, you have, I, I have some, uh, some of their comic strategies here on the slide. They exploit metaphors that, uh, the, uh, um, yeah, I think you saw that already. Um, a few methodological remarks similar to the Griala group I start from a social semiotic perspective to analyze the comicality of topically bound sketches or story fragments. 
for the performance, the hyperstylization of the outward appearance of the persona is often important since it either coheres with a speech style or works with a comic clash between the appearance of a person and the way she speaks. Hyperstylization works with telling details on all level, levels. Um, comical strategies integrate, of course, lots of verbal jab lines and punch lines, but, al but also these incongruities between looks, gestures, mimics, and ways of speaking. Let's take a look at, a, at the next example on your handout. That is a much quoted sketch that I analyzed in a paper 2006. Um, this sketch, as many, resemble, resembles a joke, this transcultural prototype of standard monological humor, but it realizes many uh, jab lines, but also a, pun a multimodal punchline in, in the end. Um, uh, yeah. As is usual and unavoidable in comedy, both characters in this sketch are larger than life stereotype, stereotypes. Kreumann herself plays an overly correct, prudish looking type with a high necked, um, tightly buttoned blouse, stiff bearing, and an unflattering conservative hairstyle. This type of character is already familiar to German viewers through comedians from the 50s up to the 70s. Their characters, however, did not triumph, but rather invited viewers to look down on them. The man in this case is a sleazy, unappealing type who almost crawls over the table to get the titillating information out of her. His character is not meant to be humorous. It's uniformly stylized in behavior and manner of speech. We have no sudden frame shift, but an ongoing double framing. Um, what makes the sequence funny is that the woman's speaking style creates a continuous and increasingly sharp contrast between her hypercorrect and elevated formality and the drastically vulgar content. Her formality is, a pair, is also apparent in her straight-laced appearance, but above all in her elaborate syntax. For example, in this short scene here, um, well, I read it now, uh, they, uh, 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 um, the comic twist, of course, starts earlier. The colleague um, attempts to embarrass her by asking for explicit details about her private sexual life. She isn't shocked or offended, which we would expect in such an office situation. She merely asks him to be more precise. You wish to know when I last had an orgasm. Is that correct? Especially the phrase, is that correct? suggests an elevated, dignified style. Um, um, and it goes on uh, like that, um, up to this. Um, now the name Hussey really doesn't appeal to me. Why don't you refer to me as a hysterical bitch or perhaps a hot little nympho, as is usual in other offices? I was in the accounts department the other day there, that kind of language is quite the norm. So what is acceptable for the accounts department really should be suitable for us too. Um, so the elevated style with its complex lexical choices contrasts sharply with the vulgar expressions she so freely and explicitly uses. 
She suggests even worse terms for her, as though her department were in direct competition with others in this regard. This is also an illusion to ongoing interdepartmental competition. The actual climax at the end of the sketch deals with the fact that the female employees have collected money so their male colleague can visit a brother. She presents their suggestion, suggestions with a stereotypically pejorative vocabulary which indexes groups of tavern regulars talking about women, but here uh, is here being applied to a uh, male. Yeah, uh, a short, um, well, where did I integrate this? It somehow got lost. Oh, it's here. Oh, just a moment. Wann ist es Ihnen eigentlich das letzte Mal gekommen? Wie meinen? Na, wann es Ihnen zum letzten Mal gekommen ist. Sie möchten wissen, wann ich zum letzten Mal einen Orgasmus hatte, gehe ich da recht? Ja. Also als alter Kollege muss man doch im Bilde sein. Also los, wie war's? Ja, meinen Sie jetzt anal, vaginal oder oral? Also Sie sind mir aber ein ausgepufftes Luda. Also die Bezeichnung Luda sagt mir nicht so zu. Vielleicht könnten Sie mich wie in anderen Büros üblich wahlweise als hysterische Ziege oder aber als geile Nutte bezeichnen. Ich war zum Beispiel neulich in der Buchhaltung, da ist dieser... Sch okay, unfortunately I can only play two minutes of that uh, and uh, I'd like to go on. Today, this line of a new body politics is still at work in comedy. Um, <clears throat> Caroline Kebekus, uh, uh, she's currently very popular in Germany, also works in her comic style with a broad repertoire of indexes combining a formerly masculine semiotics with new feminist counterattacks against male chauvinism. In an interview, in, in, in lots of interviews, she states that parts of the audience find her proleto and vulgar. She says that she welcomes being taken as that because she has often heard that she is quite funny for a woman. She says in interviews that she had tried to become, a, to become coarse and crass in order to be noticed in the male comedy scene at all. Currently, comedians can even go further than their male counterparts. They benefit from a widespread feeling that things need to be turned, or, turned around now. In example three in your handout, Kebekus makes her audience laugh with jab lines about flatulence, which she uses to defend herself against an assaulting masseur in a hotel while on holiday with her mother in Turkey. She also practices humor that plays on the border of physical etiquette. Like other comedians, Kebekus stands alone on stage as a narrator and presents the artistic persona as being hers. She tells in, in, the, uh, in the transcript and here, she tells how she asked her mother how the masseur treated her whether he took the towel away from her. And um, in line three, she quotes her mother, um, oh, please, Carolyn, of course not. Then she realizes um, that she got a totally, as a young woman, she got a totally different treatment. Instead of complaining to the hotel management, she books another massage and tells with many details how she plans to shock Murat, the masseur. 
She wants to fart after eating onions and the like. We have a similar frame reversal than we saw in Kreumann's sketch. That is a, a certain topical uh, line. Um, while Kebekus and Kreumann uh, enjoy great popularity um, uh, of the, uh, among the German uh, television audiences, Kebekus especially among uh, the young, this figure, Ilka Bessin, with her figure, Cindy from Marzahn, Marzahn is a poor Berlin region, encountered, okay, encountered a divided echo. The stage program, which she gave, which she gave up a year ago, played on the derivation of the name Cindy from Cinderella. The outfit of the Cindy figure rarely follows the common good taste. Her fullness, the blonde hair with the dark roots, her little crown and the pink jogging suit are, are supposed to trivialize her, but her full body stands against, against it and also lend her the ironic image of a failed princess. Uh, okay, pink is a classic girl's index. Her performance as a princess, however, runs counter to social notions of a princess. She plays with it and breaks this image. Um, um, in her program, not every prince comes on a horse back. Uh, princess Cindy sits on her throne in a pink, in this pink dress, lets the audience throw her food on stage and eats it. She overdoes the stereotype of an unemployed welfare recipient. As always, comedy lies in the skillful exaggeration. In an empirical study of the media discourse on weight, Villa and Zimmermann write that in our society, a media construction of a so-called normal body is now of great importance. And this Cindy figure counteracts these um, moral images. Um, in, the example, in, uh, in the example in your handout, um, she, uh, the Cindy figure tells of a conversation with a waiter. Um, I don't go into, uh, I don't have the time to go into the details here. Beer is involved as a milieu index and uh, sexual details reinforce the evocation of a socially subordinate milieu. Her uh, aggressiveness, traditionally more of a masculine index, can be interpreted as a break with a performance of femininity. We can speak of category-bound behavior as ethnomethodologists do, which simultaneously refers to a lower uh, uh, social class and an unusual or unpopular pattern of femininity. Ilka Bessin gave up this persona because she found it self-denigrating, which, which it was uh, in a sense. Um, uh, a few further <laughs> remarks on indexing and metapragmatics from a social semiotic perspective. Signs are considered to be resources which people use to make meaning. In, the, in these respects, so social semiotics was influenced by and shares many of the preoccupations of metapragmatics as Ruiz Gurillo has pointed out and has much in common with ethnomethodology and the theory of doing X. Um, if specific speech activities and their stylization uh, and their stylistic realizations in society are connected with historically 
developed associations, they can, among other, others, index a particular expression of gender as a second order indexicality. Gender foils that arise, uh, that arise thus are then suitable for performing various identities or, and can be comically overdone. Ox took the finding that for linguistic and communicative procedures there is little exclusivity of reference to gender as an occasion to reflect on non-exclusive procedures of communicating gender. These procedures require interpretation of the participants in, within a community of practice. Activities and their stylistic realizations point to historically developed social, social types. Comedy plays with that. Um, okay, I, I already pointed out that uh, the, uh, the princess Cin the Cindy plays also with class indexes and with a lot of gender indexes. Um, because meta-pragmatics describes relations between different discourses, it relates crucially to the context, to the concepts of intertextuality or interdiscursivity, so central for many sorts of humor. Uh, with the contributors to Ruiz Gurillo, 2040, we think that humor plays with foils of social categories that are suitable for performing various identities which can be comically overdone. Uh, I, 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 I think I have time to give you one example of parody in a, uh, in a st stricter sense, analyzing parody, I, do, I, 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 I will not do that in Judith Butler's framework. Um, and who, Butler is interested in gender parody, particularly manifest in drag as a procedure to denaturalize gender as such. She attributes a revolutionary potential to drag. I'm less enthusiastic about this revolutionary potential, but hope to show that comedy is a means of negotiating the contradictions and complexities of men's and women's lives in postmodern societies and of gender politics as such. We will uh, not look at cross-dressing, but at specific incongruities, as we already did in dressing and talking. Um, just, I, 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 I just go into one example. Parody is regarded as a prime example of intertextuality since it unfolds its meaning only in relation to a previously known text. Parody is thus, in a broader sense, a form of playing with a source text which doesn't necessarily need to have a textual structure but can also stylize a person's way of speaking and behavior. Not only are certain characteristics of a person or situation or social type overdone, but they are also brought together with a new function in this new context. In the background is the ethnometodon ethno-methodological concept of doing a social category. Have a look at example five in your handout. Um, Anke Engelke, who is also very famous for at least 15 years, or 20, maybe 20 years, on German TV, she uh, presents a classical hippie type. Her hairstyle, clothing, cosmetics correspond to this look. The woman speaks directly to the audience with a very deep voice and I give you an impression. Oh, 
Olympia, ne? das ist auch so eine Sache für sich. Ne? Das ist wieder so eine Faschokiste, wo der perfekte Körper massentauglich glorifiziert werden soll. Ja? Aber die Kranken und Behinderten, die werden da ausgeschlossen. So Leute, und jetzt sage ich euch mal was. Wie wäre es denn mal mit einer Olympiade für Behinderte? Ja, da kommt ihr jetzt nicht mit klar. Ne? Ich hätte nämlich auch schon einen Namen. Behindi-Spiele. Oder Frigiade. Nee. Nee, jetzt hab, warte, jetzt hab ich's. Paralympics. Was guckst du denn so behindert jetzt? Okay. Engelke caricatures a known it all type who thinks everyone else is stupid and assigns herself great commitment. The main point, of course, is that these Paralympics have been around for a long time. However, the type of the non-conformist woman hasn't noticed them yet. The parody includes various cleverly noticed details, uh, especially the speech uh, style. Um, she uses a lot of ne, that, that is uh, a, tag, uh, a, a tag question. Um, uh, after a stay in Germany, the English conversation analyst, Gail Jefferson, wrote a slightly ironic essay on what she called the abominable ne, ne uh, uh, and means, uh, and she uses exactly this abominable ne, uh, which um, um, it still invites approval after the final intonation and semantics have already completed the communicative minimal unit. The known it all habitus also includes prosody, um, yeah, the prosody of great thoughtfulness. Okay, I think I should, uh, uh, I cannot go into uh, the other details. I just, uh, okay, I have five minutes left. I just um, want to point out uh, that there are of course, also par uh, parodies of concrete persons. Um, Christine Prayon, for example, uh, uh, parodies Carla Bruni, uh, the former uh, French uh, president's wife. The Yellow Press praised Carla Bruni for having had an impressive career as a model behind her when she met the former French president. Until the end of 2007, the world knew Carla Bruni mainly as a singer. The yellow press emphasized that her name stood for one thing above all else, a passionate and uncompromising lifestyle. And, and this image is exactly dis, uh, deconstructed here in this parody which works with a French accent in German <laughs> uh, and uh, several, several word plays such as Freiheit and Freiheit. She has, she, um, it is shown that she has absolutely no political idea. Um, uh, I'd like to, well, this is what she does, and um, uh, parodic performances of femininities and masculinities deepen our understanding about various representations of gender in specific social life worlds. Female characters include a complex mix of specific traits and simultaneously reinforce and destabilize predominant female stereotypes, similar to what Lockyer uh, writes about bridge comedy. Critical perspectives vary in the degree of progressivity. Um, I cannot, yeah, yeah, he is an interesting case in itself, but, uh, and he works with lots of indexes of femininity, and masculinity, um, uh, but I will, uh, I'm about to uh, come to my final remarks. 
television comedy is an import, I cite Lockyer again, television comedy is an important lens through which questions, uncertainties, and anxieties about gender across the ages in contemporary British society are constructed and deconstructed. And this also holds true for Spanish, German, and lots of comedies from other countries. I in integrated comedy studies in interpretive sociolinguistics and metapragmatic studies. I, I think uh, similar to works of your group in, yeah, um, parts of the humor are overdone. Parts of the humor of overdone characteristics of a social type can be explained with two features of what Bergson finds important in Le Rire. The mechanical uh, moment, par parody works in a sense with imitation and, um, and it is interesting that we, that we find imitation. Of course, imitation is always overdone in parody. Uh, but we find it funny uh, that some features are exactly met. And, uh, and there are lots of allusions to established societal norms with which the observers are familiar, of course. Muchas, muchas gracias again for your attention. Vielen Dank, Helga. Um, thank you so much for your brilliant talk. Uh, we have now a few minutes, five, ten minutes for questions. This is a question. I, I have here the microphone. So long. Uh, wait.
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that is an important question. Uh, um, uh, I, I totally, uh, I, I know it is like that. Uh, they, the, the sketches, the shows are written and produced by, by mixed groups. And um, uh, Maren Kreumann, uh, for, for example, in, in the beginning, most of her sketches were written by, <laughs> it is really interesting, uh, by Simone Borowiak. Uh, a, a woman who then uh, became transgender and she's now Simon Boro Borowiak. Um, uh, the, uh, Engelke ha has a mixed team. Um, uh, she, uh, Kreumann very often takes part in writing, uh, writing, writing the scripts. Engelke sometimes takes part in writing the scripts, but most, of, nearly all of them have a, have a mix, have mixed uh, groups in the background who develop uh, the program. And the, uh, the interesting case uh, of Engelke that you, that you mentioned, Engelke was the first late night presenter, the first female late night presenter on German TV. I have written an article about that. Uh, she, um, the, as you said, uh, this program uh, on, uh, on, on a private channel lasted only for six months. Uh, people didn't find it funny. Uh, uh, and we, uh, we, came to know that the audience, the audiences, the several audiences, um, were not really ready for having a female late night presenter. Uh, um, f f uh, before that, um, Harald Schmidt was for many, many years uh, uh, the, I underline the, the one, uh, a very, very popular late night presenter. He commented on, on, uh, on political everyday uh, stuff by uh, making ironic and satirical remarks. And, and um, that is really a role uh, that in the German speaking media um, still is not, I, I would say, is not much accepted. So, yeah, thank you for uh, that additional um, side. Okay, thank you. We have uh, time but for one or two short questions, please. Or any question more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th thank you for that question too. Um, uh, the, uh, the misfits um, s stopped this program too be because it, uh, after many years of uh, doing that, it, uh, it seemed to lose attraction. And in, in, uh, uh, there is a broad scene. I had to leave out uh, lots of comedians. Um, uh, uh, as, as I said in, in the beginning, um, many of them uh, present their shows in a dialect. And f for example, there are many that are especially 
popular in Bavaria, and they just stand, that, that is, a, in, a, in a sense, it is um, another type, although they also stand in front of the public and just tell stories from their every, everyday life in strong Bavarian dialect. So, so the, uh, um, the, the, po the, the uh, there is a mixture, and, uh, but, but on the other hand, very famous um, among the young is Hazel Brugger, a Swiss, who also, she has a very dry type of humor, and she, pre, pre, uh, and she, she is also a narrator on stage, but she, uh, she works a lot with these old role reversal things. S so I cannot say that it's over. It still goes on. A little, the styles uh, differ in some ways, but, but this topical line of negotiating, negotiating new face standards, body, uh, uh, embodied face standards. I think it is really going on, still going on. Uh, thank you so much, Helga, again. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, more time, but uh, you can speak about all the topics uh, during the conference. We have now the coffee break uh, with a coffee, uh, <laughs> real coffee. Uh, this is not ironic. Uh, this is a real coffee in front of Aula Magna in uh, the Bugambillas Alley. Okay? Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you.